created world is depicted as this dark, chaotic place, but then above the chaos, God's spirits that are hovering, ready to bring about life and order and beauty. Okay, but what is God's spirit? Yeah, so the spirit is the way the biblical authors talk about God's personal presence. The Hebrew word is ruach. Ruach? Yeah, you gotta clear your throat at the end. So what is it? Well, ruach can refer to a number of different things, but what they all have in common is energy. Energy, how so? So there's an invisible energy that makes the clouds move or the tree branches sway. Right, wind. So in Hebrew, that's ruach. Okay. Now take a big breath. So you feel that inside you. Yeah, the air. Well, specifically the energy, right? The vitality in your body that you get from breathing deeply, that too is ruach. And this is the same word used in the Bible to describe God's personal presence. Just like wind and breath are invisible, God's spirit is invisible. Wind is powerful, and so God's spirit is powerful. And just as breath keeps us alive, so God's spirit sustains all of life. Yeah, Ruach. Now, as we continue on in the story of the Bible, we see God's Ruach giving special empowerment to people for specific tasks. The first person in the Bible this happens to is Joseph. God's Spirit enables him to understand and interpret dreams. And then it happens to this guy named Bezalel, and he's an artist. God's Spirit empowers him with wisdom and skills. He's given creative genius to make beautiful things in the tabernacle. And we also see God's Ruach empower a group of people called the Prophets. They're able to see what's happening in history from God's point of view. That's exactly right. And here's the problem as the Prophets saw it. While God's Ruach had created a really good world, humans have given in to evil, they've unleashed chaos into it through their injustice. A new type of disorder. Yes, and the prophet said the spirit would come, just like in Genesis 1, but now to transform the human heart, to empower people to truly love God and others. How will this new act of God's spirit happen? Well, centuries pass, and we are introduced to Jesus. And at the beginning of his mission, there's this beautiful scene where Jesus is being baptized in the waters of the Jordan River. Yeah, the sky opens up, and God's Spirit comes and rests on him like a bird. The story is saying that God's Spirit is empowering Jesus to begin the new creation. And we see this happening when he heals people or forgives their sins. He's creating life where there once was death. Now, Israel's religious leaders oppose Jesus, and they eventually have him killed. But even here, God's Spirit is at work. The earliest disciples of Jesus, who saw him alive from the dead, said it was God's energizing spirit that raised Jesus. This is the beginning of new creation. Yes, and it's still going. When Jesus appeared to his closest followers, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And soon after that, the Spirit powerfully comes on all of his disciples. So that they can become a part of this new creation, and share the good news and learn how to live by the energy and influence of God's Spirit. And so, today, the Spirit is still hovering in dark places. Yes, pointing people to Jesus, transforming and empowering them so they can love God and others. And the Christian hope is that the Spirit is going to finish the job. The story of the Bible ends with a vision of a new humanity, living in a new world that's permeated with God's love and life-giving spirit.
Are you coming to visit me? How wonderful. I bet one of our one of our wranglers will come and get you, but you can stay here for a minute, okay? That's the usual one. Okay, All right, Grandma? What? Here she is. Okay. Um, <laughs> you got to go with Grandma. Okay? Plus a mama, okay? Alright. Oh my goodness. Okay, alright, so anyway, I was up in the attic. I shimmied up through the um, the trapdoor in the attic. Trapdoor is about that big. So I got up in there, yep, and it was 4,000 degrees, and I breathed in enough insulation to last me a lifetime. And it was wonderful. And when I got over to the exhaust fan, they have a little housing on them, and you get over to the housing, and I thought, I'm going to get this thing detached. I've watched the videos. I know how to do it. I got to what's called a junction box, which is one of these shiny boxes that is one of these things. And I opened it, and I thought, okay. And it wasn't quite that bad, but it was pretty close. Um, and I, and I, I began with this, this esoteric bit of this strategy that I had watched on YouTube and practiced several times. Very serious, and I'll see if I can display it for you. Eeny, meeny, <laughs> um, So, anyway, I started pulling out wires, and I thought, I'll just put these back the way they go, because I know what I'm doing. Um, and I had turned off all the electricity to where I was, and everything else. What I didn't know is that in these old houses, you never quite know where the electricity's going, and what's attaching to what exactly. So I began to take off the junction box off the thing with a metal screwdriver. So, electricity is a funny thing. <laughs> Bit of a living thing. Kind of hard to tell where it's going to go. And I had not quite turned off all the juice to where I was. And my metal screwdriver must have created some kind of connection. Anyway, when I got the flames blown out, I... Um, got back up, and I shimmied back out of the trap door, and went into the living room going, Hello, electrician. <laughs> this is Pastor Josh. <laughs> I can't imagine how it sounded from below me in the living room. My book on tape going, this is what I do, pass the time, and I'm listening to this old theology book by this British thinker. The Everlasting Man by G.K. Testerton, and it's talking, you know, and this is dedicated to Dr. H.G. Wells, who proved that philosophy can be done by anyone and be unburdened by the facts, and all these sort of quippy British things, and then, <laughs> and then some words that were not on the book on the table, and then me coming back down to call the electrician. So, I didn't and I don't know what I was doing working with the wrong tools from the wrong angle on the wrong stuff. I don't understand electronics and I don't know how it all works together. I take more of a Ben Franklin approach, you know, with a kite and a string. And I turn on my microwave and it goes on its magic. I have no idea what it is, but when I looked at the inner workings of it, my mo, I saw there were several pieces that needed to work together in order for these things to happen. A complicated web of parts that don't come completely rightly together until they're all hooked up and doing their part. I had short-circuited something in there, and I'm glad it wasn't a more powerful something. Anyway, as human beings created in the image of God, we are multivalent, multi-level creations. We look like that on the inside. We have minds capable of vivid pictures and colossal ideas, and then to convey them, we have to outsource these to our mouths which, you know, only works so-so, and then that has to go to someone's ear, and you never know how that's working. And then it goes in their brain with their colossal ideas, and they all beat up on each other. And even within ourselves, we have this disconnection. We have these things that go on inside ourselves that don't seem to work together. Our mind may know that a thing is true, but we don't feel it in our hearts at all. Or we may feel very strongly that something is true, and when we look at it, it's obviously not true. The disconnection and short-circuiting between mind and heart is one of life's greatest thrills. 
In our culture, two people get married, and a few years into it, after some real life, after he tries to fix the exhaust fan a few times, and things kind of wear, wear a little bit, they don't feel exactly like they felt on the day you spent $20,000 to look your best, our culture says, ah, trade it in for a new one. When the fields are gone, or the fields change, then forget it. On the other side of this, we have it in the Christian world, where we get our theology down to a fine point. We get it down to glistening, gleaming points, and we have it all perfect, and yet we have no joy, and no love, and no power over sin, and no outreach for the broken. The heart divided again from the mind. The Greek philosopher Aristotle said that we are rational animals. Rational animals. And Brennan Manning, who's one of my favorite writers, Christian writer who struggled with alcohol his whole life, said, I am not a rational animal. I am an angel with an immense appetite for vodka. That is who I am. Our scripture looks at our connection between mind and heart, how the mind and heart and body all work together in humanness without short-circuiting by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So we'll look at the biblical concept of peace, which in... Hebrew is Shalom, and in Greek is Irene. Irene. My original title for today was Come on, Irene. Come on, Irene. I changed. Anyway. And how this peace is the mark of God's presence and his power, and how only with that in place does the human being work without short circuiting. So, our title for today Don't Short Circuit Yourself. Don't Short Circuit Yourself. I'm going to talk to you about three things today. The Holy Spirit, Shalom, and Rise and Go. The Holy Spirit, Shalom, and Rise and Go. And we'll look at our scripture for today. That's John 14, verses 23 through 30. John 14, 23 through 30. Should be between Luke and Acts. At least it is in my Bible. And 14 should between, be between you know, 13 and 15. So. All right. Jesus answered, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper and the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, let them, never let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father and the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place so that when it does take place you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so the world may know that I love the Father. Rise and let us go from here. If you remember last week, we were in the chapter just before this one, John 13. We are in the farewell discourse at the chapters at the end of John. If you want to impress a very specific type of nerd, tell them that you're reading the Farewell Discourse of John. That will get you street cred. This is Jesus preparing his disciples for what things will be like when he is gone. And it's the longest bit of dialogue we have in one sustained way from Jesus anywhere. Last week we talked about Jesus washing feet. He started the Last Supper evening by taking the place of the lowest servant, someone who was not hated, who was not respected but was ignored and disregarded. Jesus told us to do this for each other as a sign that we are his disciples. He drove home that we won't be known by our excellent facilities, we won't be known by our airtight theology or our dashing personalities, but that we will be known by our love. He showed us this by example in washing feet and becoming an invisible person at that point. We're just finishing our six-week-long series on the book of John, which I call Perspective from the Eagle Eye. John was the last to write his gospel, and the latest writer of anything in the New Testament is kind of an eagle eye perspective about what God was up to, 
and the shape the young church was going to take. And much of his writing seems to answer some of the questions that come up in the early church. He's watched them work for a generation or so, and the Spirit is now bringing to mind, oh yeah, Jesus said something about that, I need to write about that. Because you put people together in a closed space like a church for a while, and those issues start to appear very quickly. So our first heading for today, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Today we find ourselves looking at the most misunderstood member of the Trinity. Nothing major at all today, just the very character of God, that's all. That's all we're talking about, no big deal. We as Christians believe that God is three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How exactly all these relate to each other and the ultimate inner workings of it all is indeed a mystery. And the doctrine is based on the evidence we find in Scripture that they have a relationship. They are separate, but they are one. Jesus is bringing here is his relationship with the paraclete, the comforter, the advocate, all these different words that he uses, the Holy Spirit. Three different ways to translate it. So who can tell me the first place that the Holy Spirit shows up in the Bible? Genesis. 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 1-1, one, one, that's right. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And like we saw in our video, the Holy Spirit isn't someone who just came on the scene at Pentecost in Acts 2. He didn't just, just arrive at that time. He's been around forever. The Spirit has been doing the work of God since long before then, inspiring Joseph to, return, to interpret dreams, inspiring Bethsalel in the Old Testament to make great art and to create the temple. The presence of the Holy Spirit under the Old Covenant was spotty at best, only coming down on certain people for certain purposes at certain times. And with Jesus, all that changes. The Spirit comes to rest on Him during His baptism as a dove, and after His resurrection, when the Word is complete and the work is complete, Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit on His disciples. He breathes it out. And as